Hello, everybody. How are you? You are very welcome to the final session of Transform, the Changing Consumer. You are all very welcome. Thank you for joining us here. Uh, my name is Patrick Hawhey. I will be your MC for today's session. Um, so as you may know, the Transform series is a new free online seminar that has ex been exploring the growing impact of digital transformation on business and society. We'll be covering a total of six areas ranging from the future of work to smart cities and communities, the circular economy and lots more. Now, the topic for discussion today is what we can learn from previous epidemics or previous pandemics about changes to consumer behavior, a really, really interesting topic. And to discuss it, I am delighted to be joined by uh, three eminent members of DCU, of course, Professor Theo Lin, um, who is Professor of Digital Business here at DCU Business School, Dr. Pierangelo Rosati, Assistant Professor in Business Analytics at DCU Business School, and of course, Darry, Dr. Gary Sinclair, lecturer in marketing, specializing in consumer behavior at DCU Business School. So before I get to the panel, just in terms of yourselves, we would love your interaction. We would love your questions throughout. Um, just to let you know, the chat function is disabled. So please only use the Q&A tab. So again, no chat function is, is uh, up and running, but your Q&A tab is, what that means is you can feed your questions into that. And then throughout the session, I'll be keeping an eye on that. If anything comes in that is relevant to, you know, what we're discussing at that particular point in time, um, I will put it straight to the guys. And um, so please do, don't wait to the end if you have a question, pop it in there. Uh, and then of course, with whatever time we have remaining at the end, um, we, I will put your questions to uh, our three panelists. Okay, well, listen, let's kick things off. And um, Theo, I'm gonna start with yourself uh, because I guess in the context of learning things from previous pandemics, from previous epidemics, when we talk about past and previous pandemics, what are we talking about? Maybe set the scene for us. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose to put it into context myself, uh, and Pierre Angelo and Gary and, and the rest of the team in IIDB and across DCU, um, uh, prior to coronavirus, but obviously accelerated after COVID-19, um, have been looking at different projects and we've been doing analytics projects in Brazil and other places. And one of the things, you know, <clears throat> if you were listening to Donald Trump, you'd swear to God the Spanish flu was the only uh, pandemic. But, you know, obviously there's been about 18 um, global pandemics since the late 19th century. Um, and COVID-19 isn't even the first coronavirus, you know, so, so COVID-19 um, is, is very similar to SARS or MERS. So, you know, SARS was around 2002. Um, it, it didn't particularly impact Ireland, um, but, but uh, SARS, um, uh, they think came from bats. So that's where a lot of the bat uh, discussion comes from. So we think coronaviruses came from bats in that, and that was a China virus. So it came from bats in China. To date, they found uh, over maybe four or five years, really running from 2002 up to about 2005, they were able to identify uh, coronavirus in dogs, uh, civets, badgers, a whole variety of different animals, okay, get SARS. And they spread to the human population um, as per the various conspiracies through uh, what we originally think was Chinese markets. Okay, so that's where quite a lot of that story comes from. Um, SARS as a disease in particular uh, became a pandemic and, and through uh, uh, an Asian businessman traveled to Hong Kong and then that spread that way. We were actually able to identify the person who's, who was heavily involved in spreading the disease. Um, but just to put it into context, uh, since 2004, there's been no fatalities to, to SARS, okay? Um, MERS, slightly different, that, that emerged in around 2012. Again, they believe the original virus comes from a bat, but actually is primarily transmitted towards con uh, human contact with camels. So, um, we're pretty safe in Ireland. We don't have lots of camels. Uh, although now I think back to it myself, there's a good video of me and Pierangelo trying to uh, uh, travel on a, on a camel, but that's a different day story. But but the- uh, that's, that's a whole webinar in itself, Theo. Yeah, that, that, I, that, I want to subscribe to that webinar. That, that could be an adult film. Um, so <laughs> uh, so uh, I think there's even a video. Um, I, I, I think the, the key thing there is, um, uh, MERS was primarily contained around the Raven Peninsula. And uh, 
one specific thing about MERS was it had a very high mortality rate. So if you got it, which was very rare, uh, the mortality rate was up there around 35%. So it was a very high mortality rate. Uh, and, and to date, there's no vaccine for, for uh, MERS, as far as I know, anyways. And so they're coronaviruses. And that key thing about uh, COVID-19 is um, what is quite interesting from a consumer behavior perspective. So obviously when we're talking about consumer behavior, we're actually talking about the psychology of people. And what we can say about SARS and MERS is that ultimately, particularly in the case of SARS, it spread to around 26 countries. And in our, although we weren't particularly impacted by either of those two coronaviruses, obviously other markets were. And it would be wrong to think that they were either purely Arabian and purely Asian. Uh, for instance, the Canadian um, uh, Canada got, got impacted quite, quite heavily by um, SARS in particular. So uh, right. you know, in particular kind of context, there's things that we can learn from those um, epidemics and pandemics and how they change our attitudes and our dispositions to a whole variety of different things. And particularly in the case of SARS, where the transmission was through travel and business travel and air travel. And, and so I had a particularly big context. I had a bit, obviously the response in particular countries like Taiwan, Hong Kong, China to a lesser degree, because when we look at China in 2002 uh, onwards, obviously their internet usage and stuff was, it was significantly behind other markets. But if you look at say more developed countries like Hong Kong, Taiwan, Canada, I think there are quite a lot of learnings that we can take from that. And we can look forward and take insights from that about what might happen. In this particular case, myself and Pierre uh, did some work on this in um, early summer last year. And, and as it happens, quite a lot of the things that we anticipated are now coming through into the, into the market. So uh, I think it's a timely uh, discussion. So, uh, so that's what we're talking about. We're talking about um, really focusing on what we can learn from the recent coronavirus pandemics, because obviously they're a similar type of, of virus and uh, we call that a zoonotic type virus that's going through the animal kingdom. And then the second thing is, um, it is in that time where the internet is available. So we know what the impact uh, on, on life might be. So I think that's where we're at. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's, a uh, turn to yourself now, Pierangelo, um, there's obviously some particular sectors that have been more impacted um, than others are particularly, you know, certainly they're, they, uh, on the face of it, they have been uh, to date. So I'd like to maybe drill down into a couple of those sectors, um, starting with health. Um, when we looked at health, when we looked at the health sector, you know, that, that kind of area, what was the experience and um, the impact that we saw through those other pandemics that Theo mentioned there and, and maybe some of the things we can take from those? Uh, thanks, Patrick. Uh, well, obviously, uh, healthcare workers and frontline workers in general have been uh, negatively impacted uh, from both from a physical point of view and from a mental point of view. But the the actual mental health and health issues generally will expand to the uh, expanded to the general population. And to be a bit more specific, uh, as still mentioned, we did a bit of research there a few months ago on trying to map out what can we actually learn from a from an health health perspective and a common theme across almost all studies were the the presence of negative negative mental health and psychological effects and um, something like uh, PTSD symptoms uh, confusion hunger and the and there was a clear correlation between these symptoms and like a longer quarantine uh, infection fear to um, infection fears, uh, boredom, and generally speaking, inadequate uh, information or the fear of financial losses. And I, I was uh, I was kind of intrigued by a Canadian study there was, was looking specifically at SARS, and they were able to quantify that approximately 29% of their sample and uh, show some PTSD symptoms and more than 30% of the sample showed um, some sort of a depression symptoms. And of course there was more interesting, there was a clear correlation between these symptoms and the fact that participants were either diagnosed with SARS or had been quarantined for a longer period of time. And I think 
all of these we can we can kind of recognize some traits, some outcomes, and uh, are the in the current in the current situation here uh, during the COVID nineteen pandemic, and because let's face fact, we've all been bored at some point in time at home, not knowing not what uh, knowing not to do, and so on, and and I think I think so. You can definitely see common traits in there, and um, so. And particularly the fact that there were studies also saying that the Generation Z, so essentially the youngest generation at the moment, is shown a, is more prone to develop some sort of um, mental health issues. I think that's probably more worrying uh, in the current situation than it was in the past. And do we know why that why that is that this that particular generation um, do feel it a little more poignantly? Well, I think there there is a there is a combination of factors and of course there is there is a wide discussion there for example on the widespread use of social media where people are constantly measured measure themselves against against their peers and of course we tend to share on social media only the good things not the bad things so uh, i can't remember what i what i heard a few days ago with someone saying like I, it's like comparing yourself to tor every every single day and to tour. Will tell you, <laughs> essentially, you have a you have a tour there every day, reminding you that you're not as strong as him or and not as good as him, and that happens multiple times a day, every single day, and that's just one of the causes. And and then of course there are also other other factors coming into play, but if you the overall picture is is quite worrying. Just you know, I I feel that Pierre. Yeah, and I guess message to me is that what you call me in privately do you call me <laughs> <laughs> i think like linked to that mental health aspect is i think is is actually really important what per angelo was talking about there particularly amongst kind of generation uh, gen z uh people is what's interesting about that is how it interacts with the market in terms of how brands are kind of acknowledging like the times that we're going through and from that perspective like we're looking at it from a COVID perspective and um, like at the start of the crisis you see that major brands played like a really important role in you know in public health directives like, you know, in terms of providing information and like kind of these kind of functional aspects and, and, and some of them did it responsibly and some of them maybe uh, not so much but now what we see with, with brands and Speaking kind of, of the not so responsible, we'll get, we'll get to Ryanair in a couple of moments. Yeah, don't, I have a few things to say there. <laughs> but like even now, yeah. if you look at even kind of but like, let's stick with the responsible kind of, for now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, even like even really kind of general like mundane products and services, like we're at a different stage of the pandemic now where they're actually kind of speaking to, you know, um, you know, kind of more mental health issues. Like you know, so even if it's something like McCain oven chips or something like that there always seems to be like a nod and a wink to to the boredom to the repetition to the zoom meetings you know and to the kind of the new and failed yeah piece like so like i suppose um like research backs up like that you know consumers actually want to hear from brands during a crisis which uh it was a kind of harvard business review study i think that, that talked about that quite recently and um, like that surprises me because, you know, I'm a cynic um, and I never want to hear from brands, you know, so the results of studies like this always surprise me. But just like the fact that um, uh, this like, kind of case study was showing this, like this like, really shows you the importance uh, of communication. Like, and that's a lot of communication that we get day in, day, in, day out, like whether it's solicited or, or, or not, you know. Um, yeah. Do you and think it's, there's an element, Gary? Um, sorry, Patrick, yeah. Sorry, Gary, just a quick question on that. Do you think there's an element of in times where everything else has been thrown up in the air and we don't know where we are from one day to the next because things have changed so much that we we take some sort of solace in clinging on to the things that have been there almost forever, like McDonald's has been there forever. You know, there's big brands have been there forever. So maybe there's we get some sort of a, a sense of security that they're still there. Everything else might seem to be totally mm -hmm. changing and up in the air, but they're still there and wait, 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 there's wait. something in that. Yeah, that's it. And even like, like, that's probably the times we live in in the kind of age of misinformation and the kind of dangers of that. There's probably a greater trust towards what McDonald's says than what many governments would, would provide in terms of public information, you know? So like, it, it, there is actually quite a lot of social yeah. responsibility there. You see with like McDonald's as that example, like they use like the famous arches, like they separated them to kind of like communicate social distancing, you know? It's a really interesting way of... Um, of kind of communicating like 
you know, at the beginning of a particular crisis and what the kind of important, you know, uh, health information that has to be communicated uh, to a public. <laughs> but yeah, I suppose there is something kind of, kind of you know, uh, maybe it's something reassuring about, you know, seeing yourself reflected in marketing communications of like, well, I'm not, you know, in, in terms of what um, Pierre Angelo yes. talked about in terms of mental health is that, oh, like, yeah, I also am experiencing that kind of boredom or that anxiety or that kind of, uncertainty even if it's you know to sell bloody oven chips or whatever rubbish you know like so um yeah i know there's something interesting in that and i'm, I'm kind of I, yeah i suppose there's nothing else to say i, I suppose gary just he, uh, on the off side of that though is it um how will we change post-pandemic so you know what, what are we going for the oven chips and mcdonald's after covid or you know in past pandemics, obviously, the health behavior changed a bit. So do you think we'll follow past pandemic behaviors now and change our health behaviors? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. Like, well, Perangelo, I suppose some of the studies that Perangelo was talking about there are previous pandemics, you know. Um, like, the studies shown that we kind of we, we take up healthy-seeking behaviors as well, you know. So there is kind of a, a positive aspect to that too and maybe some of the uh, participants here today um in attendance like we'll kind of recognize some of these you know so like like there was a study of over 800 chinese households uh, during sars that showed that in the, you know, the three months after that epidemic i think it was about between like six and 13 percent of respondents were were exercising at least one hour per week and they were doing things like controlling their weight uh avoiding excess you know cholesterol rich food these types of things and, and actually like sleeping more you know so the, was this the, after a certain amount of time gary sorry yeah well, was this it, after a certain amount of time but it's how you use that time then too because on the flip side then you also have reports coming out from the like covid now that we're drinking more in, in, in the uk and, and and britain too so i think what i kind of see with this is that um, there's two sides of the fence here, you know, that we might be seeing it, um, you know, in reaction to the pandemic is that some take on our more extreme kind of healthy and kind of more positive uh, behaviours uh, because of the pandemic in reaction to it. And then some might go the other side and uh, take up more kind of extreme behaviours in, 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 in that's related to consumption too uh, as, as, a, as a consequence, like, you know, um, and that's kind of likely to happen during a crisis is that people are, are going to take you know, extreme reactions uh, either way. Um, yeah, but for that SARS study in particular, what was interesting about that was the people who took on the kind of more healthy consumer behaviours were the ones who were more worried about SARS. Okay, so there's a connection there where, mm -hmm. it, like, in, I, I imagine we're going to see the same things with, with COVID when some of the, the studies around that come out as well, is that it's just probably a kind of a correlation there in terms of, like, concern about the pandemic, like, or the degree of concern, I suppose. Of course, the second thing... Well, bringing it back to... Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Patrick. No, please go ahead, Theo. Go ahead, uh, go ahead. Uh, it just occurred to me, one, one of the challenges that we do have in, in COVID is a double lockdown. You, you know what I mean? That we that wasn't there with SARS and MERS, that we we went into lockdown. Mm. Obviously, in Ireland, the weather was, was quite nice. And so you saw the people were walking and going out, and I think that there was exactly as... As Gary said, you know, people actually did change their behavior a bit and were trying to be more. And then you get to the second lockdown, it's very different. It's it's wet, it's cold. Obviously, we had the Christmas thing and, and, and we're into this lockdown. And I, I, I don't know, I, this is a personal thing. I, 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 I get the feeling that people may not be as health oriented for natural reasons during the summer and then we came out after christmas and now we're back into lockdown and i think um i think that you know the the anticipation that we were coming out of lockdown and then we're back in and then this christmas and then we're locked up effectively that that, that causes a massive amount of um, maybe subconscious impact on, on how we view things and and you know, looking out into the future, how people feel about that, how they change their behavior from a health perspective is, is interesting because it's much more difficult than somewhere like Ireland to get out in the, feel like you're going out in the rain or something yeah. like that. 
uh, even if it's snowing somewhere else, you can see last week the kids are like, oh, it's snowing, there's something to do outside. But it, it is a challenge, um, I think, on the health side. And just going on the drinking thing, that certainly was, I, I know myself and Andrew were looking at that, uh, particularly in Western countries. Um, workers are particularly, you know, there was very high instances of alcoholism and um, drugs. It, just, you know, if you imagine you're being exposed to people dying and it's very different in this pressure, and I, one of the things that slightly shocks me is it wasn't that hard for us to find this research. <laughs> so it's research that's, it's not like this research came out yesterday. This research has been out there for, you know, maybe a decade, you know, five to 10 years. And yet we, I, not, I don't particularly feel either the market per se has looked and said, well, what can we put in place to help people and is there an opportunity commercially to, 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 to do something there? But equally, I'm not so sure employers, et cetera, are really getting to grips with the problems that they might have, not now, but maybe 18 to 24 months down the road or 12 months, 24 months down because obviously these things surface in a later space. I mean, um, maybe just one more point on health, but, but the one thing that, that does disproportionately impact is, is older people and people are vulnerable in society. You, you know, in one sense, I think Ireland behaves relatively more responsible than other markets in terms of we, we really focus on cocooning older people in the first pandemic and, you know, even prioritizing special needs kids in schools. And um, you know, I think the, obviously homelessness and um, things like uh, hostels and stuff like that for people who are homeless, particularly in winter months, is difficult because obviously the cocooning and the, and the uh, COVID, the social distancing is much more difficult. Um, levels of hygiene are more difficult. Um, but even at the lower end where people are losing jobs and the instruments that you put in place to actually support people in financially difficult issues are, are massively important for their mental health. You know, um, so, you know, I think that we're, we're doing a relatively good job in Ireland, but that's compared to other countries uh, where obviously you look at the States and it just seems to be a bit of a, a mess in terms of supporting people, how much should, people should be supported. And then you get into things like healthcare and the whole shoot match. If you're on the, the lower end of the, the socioeconomic spectrum, you're, you're, you're having uh, massive challenges. You're just absolutely massive challenges. And that, that has been the case in, in other markets. You know what I mean? That um, particularly, you're less likely to have uh, private health insurance and, and access to doctors. The, the whole, there's a whole um, pathos endemic in, in, in that, that, that people don't tend to talk about as much. You know what I mean? And uh, it is an important thing. Uh, uh, sorry, just, just to jump in seen... there. To, to piggyback on what Theo said there, I think uh, I would reiterate the message there that the the economic measures that that are uh, that are put out there just to um, to help out people on the um, say with lower income and so on, or those who are out of jobs, and the way they were um, they were issued in Ireland and organised in Ireland, I think they I, I would definitely reiterate the message that the Irish government from that point of view did a great job. I, I had the chance to compare that directly with what happened in Italy, where if you look at the paper, essentially, the measures were kind of similar, but the timeline to actually get the funds out there and get the the actual help uh, to people was, was much longer. And people in the first lockdown were just, uh, they didn't know what to do. They didn't know what to do and how to get to the end of the month and so on. So the, from a mental health perspective, that's uh, that's a massive, uh, that's a massive impact. And then from a, just to go back there uh, on the consumer, from a consumer behavior point of view, to be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure how we are gonna, what's what's gonna be the short and long-term impact of this pandemic, because differently from the other ones, this, this is much longer. And we had multiple waves in many countries. So for personal experience, I know there are people who are just waiting to, for this to be over, just to catch up on everything they lost in the last uh, 12, 14 months. Uh, and then other people instead might just, might definitely change their behavior and become more, uh, become healthier and adopt a healthy lifestyle, maybe work from home, home or trying to go for a walk every, every day and so on. So uh, to be honest with you, I think there would be, the impact might be a bit different 
in this case, just because of these dynamics. Well, to be honest, I'm not sure which, which of these trends will prevail in the long term. It's, it's interesting. Of course. Uh, if, oh, sorry. If, sorry, Patrick. No, no, I was just going to say, Theo, I'll come to you. Just if you are a brand, if you are a company, you are, I, I guess you probably have to not roll the dice, but you got to put your eggs in one of those baskets because you got to be preparing now for what the consumer is going to want and need in a year's time. And is that, is that, uh, are you going to take your chances on them being more healthy and kind of get into that space or is it going to be something else? So it is a real challenge for brands right now, for companies to, to get a sense of uh, where consumer behavior is because it's changing. It seems to be changing all the time. And I guess that makes it even more important to look at what has happened in other pandemics in, in other areas of the world to see, to see which way it went. Yeah, like, uh, so I, 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 yeah, and to, to that point, uh, Oh, well, well, my first point was somewhat sarcastic that I, I think I want Priyanka to call me Thor for the rest of the webinar. Um, but but the, 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 uh, the, 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 the second thing, bring up Marvel again, I, I suppose, you know, one way of looking at it is, is COVID-19 like the snap and end game? You know, everyone stops, they're living this COVID-19 life and then they just pick up where they left off previously. Do you know what I mean? So yes. there's Interesting. some people who are thinking, well, when this is all over, I'm just going to go back to work as normal. And, and, and that's how I'm going to carry on. And then there's another group of people who don't necessarily want to go back to that previous normal. And they're kind of saying, well, there's some things about coming. I, I want to work two days a week at home. Or I, I want to have some flexibility in my lifestyle. And I want to be healthier or whatever the, those things are. And that sort of as you say, Patrick, what do you plan for? Do you plan for significant change or not? And we see that when it, and I, I will talk about travel and e-commerce, but you see that with e-commerce is like, I want to support my local businesses, but I also, well, I, I, got, I know Amazon's going to deliver or whatever. And obviously you layer on top of that is what made it more complex was Brexit. So I, actually, our, you know, right now, Yes. Disappointment or dissatisfaction with say something like international e-commerce is not COVID nineteen. It's Brexit. Mm -hmm. You can see people already talking about, oh, what will I retain in my change behavior moving forward, and what will I? Uh, see, it also change with from the business side of things too. Like you know, everyone is going to be rethinking like what they what the, what they deliver to the market, like in terms of the products and services. That they deliver so if you have this kind of big I don't know, break is the wrong word to use but like you know they all oh, the kind of cliche expression like never wastes you know a good crisis like to kind of change things that you wouldn't be able to do in normal circumstances like so like even in the like i do a lot of research and like sports and, and and football and things like that and consumer behavior around that like you know you're going to see a lot of kind of changes being brought in say for example and how um like the television audience receives content, you know, that possibly couldn't be brought in when crowds are at games, you know? So like there's opportunities there that would, like they would have, say premiership clubs and things like that would have loved to have done, um, you know, pre-pandemic, but now the actual pandemic itself gives them an opportunity to kind of accelerate a lot of those kind of different types of strategies. And that that will change the market as well too, just to kind of, as a random example. Mm. No, it's not just the consumers that will will change, you know? Well, are we seeing is it would would related to that be the fact that we're now seeing the big uh, Hollywood studios going straight to the streaming sites and bypassing um, cinemas and and we, obvi for obvious reasons at the moment. But is it actually more beneficial for them? Are we going to see cinemas ever get a big release again before an Apple Plus or a Netflix or an Amazon? Well, I, I think I think that was that's particularly interesting because there could be a change from say a radical shift in the market. So if you if you look at this for example Wonder Woman 1984 you can you can buy that no sorry rent it not buy rent it for on an Apple uh, Apple TV I think for uh, 20 euro or something just for a couple of days so it's essentially the cost is pretty much euro. the same <laughs> it's either 18 or 20 hey, it's, yeah. a, it's it's 18 Oh my goodness. Yeah you you guys don't have kids in that zone. I just, like, like <laughs> Uh, but, but, you know, but that's a that's the cost of a cinema. That's crazy. Thing. Yeah, it, the thing is that is crazy about something like um, like Wonder Woman and the kind of Warner Brothers and HBO Max kind of deal is that 
similarly to like Netflix and like Amazon or any of these these streamer streamer uh, streaming platforms, they don't release numbers. They don't release numbers for how many people are watching, you know, each movie or each television show, and that's that's drastically different than say at cinema where the box office is king and the box office numbers drive everything and are released publicly, you know, and um, so getting the kind of a handle of like kind of consumer patterns even within the kind of streaming platforms is actually more complex as well too to kind of understand what, what's going on. Yeah, but I, 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 I think we've jumped the shark though on that. I mean, I, I, you can see that our entertainment and media consumption behavior has definitely changed. I mean, like, we're, we're, like, I don't say most households, but a lot of households have at least two different service providers now coming into the house, you know, whether it's Netflix and, and traditional TV or whatever. Um, and the whole entertainment and media, and how, are, how we consume entertainment, media, hospitality has changed in that kind of context. I mean, as you say with the football, do you mean there, there's something um, quite sterile about watching soccer or something right now um, and, and it's it's much more manufactured as well when you're watching you know, there's fake cl- claps and there's do you mean but Theo that will you watch when the crowds come back they'll they'll start kind of using augmenting the sound of the crowds to make it look like there's more atmosphere now because they've been allowed to do it when there's no crowd but, but, but Gary I, I would hate that to go as far as the Italian thing where they have these weird uh pictures going over the planet. you know so so it, but mm. you know what what's interesting is though what will we will we, will we travel to go to a soccer match when travel represents now a risk do, do you know what I mean um we certainly want to go to restaurants do, do you know I mean we, we we know like that was a big thing going to a restaurant going to a bar the massive part of our our culture mm. you know massive part of Italian culture you, you, you know what I mean so you 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 want to go to those things but at the same time, um, what we've seen, and we've seen some innovation on that, we've seen the, the upper end of the, the restaurant market and now takeout. So it's total, they, they, there's a new segment to our market, which is, you know, uh, high-end food takeout, Epicurean takeouts, you know, <laughs> you can go and you're yeah. buying a, a, an expensive fast food meal, or maybe it's an expensive slow food takeout. Um, but the, we, we've got a new segment in the market there as a result of this. We, we are adopting um, things like Just Eat and Uber Eats and th- these things are coming to market. McDonald's now delivers it. McDonald's was delivering in China years ago. Now McDonald's is delivering it in, in, in Ireland, only to the south side, I know, but, but that's, we'll leave that to, 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 to the side. But I, I think that um, there's an interesting consumer behavior that I think people want to support what they perceive to be a local business, but whether, whether they actually identify entertainment and media as local, I'm not quite sure. I mean, mm. I was hearing about that kid from uh, Bohemia getting uh, Bohemians uh, getting I was getting stabbed there the other day, and on TikTok there's all these people going on about oh we should. Do you think? Well, when you think about it, will the local FAI soccer club GA? What's that, how's that going to impact soccer club GA? It's going. Will people go to more local matches because they don't have the risk of travel? Maybe that's an opportunity. On the other hand, I have a feeling that it will go. Travel is a risk. So it's not worth the risk of going to some of these matches. But, yeah. to risk. And so media entertainment investment, I think, will go up. And the way we consume that's going to, it's going to accelerate. That change is going to accelerate. And you can even see it now with Disney Plus buying back catalogs and part, those partnerships being accelerated now. And actually, in fairness to Disney Plus, they through, it just shows you how important timing and luck is in these things is they launched their platform literally two months before COVID-19 hit and been riding a wave all the way through and it's Mm. helped them to negotiate catalogs that they wouldn't have got previously and so now they've managed to create a massive position in the market Mm. Um, so the digital platform thing is is, is, and it's not just Wonder Woman you know like I was dying to watch tennis <laughs> and uh, I, I'm going to have to go and do another PhD before I can actually understand what's going on in no, tennis. Don't do it. <laughs> I, I, I'm so confused. Um, uh, and then I got caught because then I watched Bill and Ted's new film and I was going, wow, Bill and Ted's and Ted are nearly the exact same concept. It's time travel somehow, right? And 
But when you think about it, um, you know, they're taking a position in the market. I, I think, Gary, the, the films that take that first move are probably going to take some share because when we saw it come up, oh, there's something there that we can do as a family and watch. And I do think that there is a, a thing where people are watching something together as a family. I think that's um, interesting too because... It, it relates to that, what you were saying about culture because it's quite interesting. Ar- Ireland has some of the highest numbers per capita pre-pandemic of, for people going to the cinema. It's actually quite a cultural yeah. thing in Ireland that's, that's really popular. Yeah. So, But it's all going to go back to that level of perceived risk like it's it's always going to depend on that as Theo says if people are going to restaurants if people are going to matches if people are going to the cinema it all it all come I think to tourism which I know we want to talk about as well it's all going to come back to that level of, of perceived risk really isn't it and, and, and how that's kind of cool and as well I, and that's it. But as but as well, you know, talking about things going back or not, I think what's happening at the moment and we see it in various statistics is that we are putting a lot more emphasis on our homes, obviously, because we're stuck in them. Um, but maybe we're, we're rediscovering what kind of a place our homes can be and how, you know, if we if we dress them up properly, if we make our garden nice, actually, do you know what we we, we maybe will want to spend more time in our homes, even when all this is gone and the risk is gone than we did previously, which in, and in which case we're seeing some businesses pivot to that now at the moment like you say theo the investment in in home entertainment um in uh, investment from restaurants in terms of uh takeouts and deliveries and meal boxes and i suppose the links in between those as well we're seeing the buy me's the deliveroos of the world you know spike up as well so um is that something is that something we've seen in other countries uh, and i guess you know maybe when they're in small apartments in certain countries it's it's not so the same but have we seen people uh want to spend more time at home uh, post pandemic in places like Canada and maybe similar places to Ireland? It, it's not post, uh, so po- post pandemic, well, first of all, post pandemic um, it is slightly different in, in terms of people, just to reiterate something that, that Gary kind of indicated there, you know, Gary, pe- people, because they're seeking health seeking behaviors, they tend to want to spend more time in the countryside. So we saw that right across the board in post, uh, particularly SARS, people wanted to go to the countryside on the weekend. People wanted to do healthy pursuits. Do you know what I mean? Uh, you see a bit of a spike in uh, mindfulness and well-being. But then if you think about the timing, mid-2000s to 2020, 2005, 2015, that was kind of a rise in that kind of trend anyhow. Do you know what I mean? But um, certainly even if we think about our own families and stuff and, and, and then a choice, you saw this big spike of people going to Donegal, <laughs> whether they thought, yes, we'll go to Donegal and therefore, think, and then all these people arrived in Dublin and actually ruined Donegal. But, but the, you know, the, the, um, the, the, there is this, there was a shift and people did go, um, they, they wanted to go into the countryside where they perceived fresh air and, the greenness, etc. That, that that was the way they perceived it. Um, certainly, if you think about um, travel and tourism, that might be a very good thing for Ireland. But it really depends on the perception that that country has of our country in terms of the rate of infection and how we treat people who get infected. So, for instance. Um, there was a couple of studies in Japan where they're looking at, at markets and Japanese uh, consumers were making travel decisions based on the coverage that that country was getting in Japan on television uh, about COVID. Now, I think we're a tale of two stories now because I think that uh, up until November last year, we were getting great positive coverage internationally. People were saying, Jesus, yeah. Ireland's managed this really well, etc. And now in the US, we, we had this week on CNN, for instance, where we were constantly up there as uh, the spike. We were the worst performers. And now, obviously, we're, we're back controlled again, except controlled to some extent uh, now. But, you know, they're making those judgments based on what they see on TV. So, you know, like, I'm not particularly surprised that people don't want to go to America. Do, do, do you know what I mean? And I'm not particularly surprised people don't want to go to UK. And we can see that just, you know, on a local level ourselves. All the French and Italian universities are all trying to get partnerships with Irish universities right now. 
because it's the only country, you know, we are the largest English speaking uh, country in Europe. Um, so, um, so you want to go learn English and you want to go to an EU country in Erasmus, you have you, you, Ireland or Malta. That's your, your, your two challenges. And no disrespect to Malta, I think we've got a, a, a better product in Ireland. And then on top of that, you go, Ireland's relatively safe. Ireland, up until Christmas anyways, we're handling COVID very well. So if I was a parent, I'd be going, oh, Ireland looks like a great shot. Um, Tio, do you think too is like the um, like the demographics for for traveling, especially for leisure reasons, is, is going to change big time now too? Like speaking to what like we were talking about in terms of like vulnerable. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think. Um, mm-hmm. So 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 we, we we know for a fact that that you know remember coronavirus is an acute respiratory disease. Do, do you know what I mean so? It, it's a very specific type of disease, and and those types of diseases disproportionately impact older people. Mm. Um, I say this as someone who's getting there on the as an older person, right? <laughs> so um, I didn't realize this until recently. But anyway, so, so the, the, the difficulty. Don't worry, we did. <laughs> yeah, I know. My, my, you know, this is the problem of being Tor, you know. Um, so um, the, the, the difficulty is as you're in that middle aged or upper middle aged cohort and older cohort, you know, you, you had more disposable income and you used to spend that on travel. Okay. And you, you, and in particular, just remember, in the U.S. and continent Europe, that, that was cruise ships. People were on cruise ships, and cruise ships, as it turned out, were the worst right. to be on in coronavirus. Okay, and so you know, when we think about that, um, you you have the combination. I want to avoid infected countries, or what I perceive as infected countries. I want to. I'm. I'm I don't want to get acute respiratory disease because I'm older, and I'm, I have a higher chance of doing that. And then. Um, you add into that type of travel where some of those uh, types of tour- tourism uh, activities um, not only at a higher transmission rate, but once you were on that, you couldn't get out of that situation. Do you know what I mean? So your, 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 your time to treatment was reduced dramatically. Um, I think that changes your behavior dramatically. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And I think that... Um, so I would put the middle-aged older cohort in one bucket. Uh, like I, I think, Gary, you probably know a bit more about this, thing, but you know, then when you're talking about tourists, there, there's risk-averse tourists and there's non-risk-averse tourists. You know? and, mm. and I think in Ireland, obviously, we have a, a, a strange gap year scenario that everyone wants to go to Australia or... Asia. Yeah, we well, have all the, like, you know, like if you're traveling to Southeast Asia or you're traveling to parts of Africa, like, you know, you have to get you know, kind of shots for like yellow fever or, or yeah. whatever different back, like that, that kind of like uh, threats and risks already exists for traveling to specific places. Like, you know, so I think that's interesting you mentioned that because that could, you probably will see some sort of a development of a market that's kind of more aimed at kind of younger, more kind of thrill seeking adventure, this type kind of yeah. uh, uh consumers in that regard um, like I know you're talking about the different demographics there but there's one thing that I think is quite interesting if we're talking about kind of pre and post pandemic is that pre pandemic especially within kind of Western Europe uh, and Australia and, and parts of America uh, the younger demographics there was a big movement uh, at least in attitudes I'm not so sure in the actual kind of market dynamics anyway uh, attitudes against kind of negative attitudes against kind of uh, flying like against kind of you know, kind of the environmental impacts of that, you know? So, um, you know, it's interesting to see kind of, you know, again, is this kind of another opportunity where that kind of type of like ideology or that type, those type of attitudes, will they kind of maybe prevail more now that there has been a kind of an extended break between air travel of like, say even for example, in our own profession, like we've flying all over the world, gone to conferences for years and now all of a sudden the conferences are online. It's kind of like, um, Maybe we've been getting away with murder, being able to go on all these trips, you know, for for these, yeah. <laughs> going, yeah. you know, and online. Which I I hate to say because, like, you know, the party's over a little bit now, maybe in that regard. But like, that's the case <laughs> within businesses as well. It's from a functional perspective outside the, Harry, the, 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 the mental the, perspective. The, the webinar yeah. is now about releasing our dirty little secrets of higher education. Uh, was it was it a conference that was online like they said it was in hawaii but it was online you know so now it's taking a point <laughs> but, but, but you mean, I, I i do think that people do fall into those buckets you know 
there are, we know that there's people who are in a segment that are crisis resistant. Do you know what I mean? There are people, like, uh, I have to laugh. So this is Pianja won a, won a European project and uh, he said, oh, Theo, we have this is a project we're going to be working on this project. I said, oh yeah, great. Where are we going? And he goes, Beirut. And I was like, going, oh yeah, Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, coming soon. And, and, you know, it's funny, we were talking about weighing that up between, say, the work we do in the middle of the Amazon, you, you know, and Pianja famously doesn't, he's not particularly fond of water. And uh, I had booked a boat, for, like, and we, we went out to the Amazon. Yeah. And, and Calling that a quite, boat is a bit of a stretch. Yeah, so you know. he was, he, I noticed he was quite nervous. So he wasn't afraid of getting, like, and just to be clear, various people have tried to mug me in Pirazzo, Mexico, Brazil. People pulled guns on us. Uh, but the thing that freaked him out was going on what was meant to be a tourist boat, which was clearly not a tourist boat on a, on a very large river with basically human-eating um, fish. And uh, I, I think that the... The thing about crisis resistance and people who are very active lives, and you know, when a, a professor who I spent a lot of time at in DCU, uh, Derek Turley, he's a great guy, uh, probably leading specialist in death and bereavement in the world. <laughs> I said, but the funny thing about Derek was, I remember him, he, you know, he's going to do Kilimanjaro, and, he, and Derek, in his late 60s, 70s, climbing Kilimanjaro, where he's going doing these treks out in the middle of nowhere. And so you can be older and have an active life. And be crisis resistant um, tend to be younger but if you look at that demographic I kind of wonder will they change their behavior because there's a big difference between being active and crisis resistant for things like warfare or you know challenges like climbing Everest or something like that and then something like uh, coronavirus, which you can catch apparently anywhere. Do you know I mean? it, it's a silent killer in one sense. Do you know what I mean? And also, just also the fact that it like it's you're not just focusing on your own risk for yourself. You're thinking about the risk, you know, for others. You know, like the risk for yourself in you know doing these kind of adventure scenes, climbing Mount Everest. It's it's very much focused on the individual. But you traveling, yeah, you know, that's the responsibility, isn't it? Really? Yeah, and and, and you know, your choices are slightly different in terms of, you know you can try and reduce the probability of catching COVID. So, you know, you can, you can try and do things alone or, you know, which is a much more solitary type of thing, or you can get more information or you can practice better hygiene. Uh, and in those contexts, I suppose, travel operators and tourism operators could plan around that better. You know, they can put those into their packages because at the moment what they tend to do is just say, we'll give you your money back if it's cancelled or something. But you could plan. I, I, I was very impressed with Emirates, which is putting you up in a five-star hotel and they have a repatriation package and stuff. But that's part. And then there's, you know, do I, do I want to shift my risk? Do you know? So instead of going to America now, or let's say maybe instead of going for a partnership with someone in California, maybe I'm going for a partnership with someone in Tulsa. Do you mean or, or vice versa? I, I, you know, maybe I'm shifting race. Maybe Ireland will turn out to be a great place to do business on the same basis. Do I postpone it? And I'm not so sure. So postponing it, what does that mean now? We don't know when we're going to get shots. We don't know how effective shots are. Certainly, the research that we do in Brazil with one of the leading guys on coronavirus. You know, in Manaus, 76% of the population uh, were showing evidence of having the COVID-19 antigen. 76% of the city, right? And the waning of that was six months. So you could catch it again after six to nine months. So, you know, we don't know. We, there's a lot of things we don't know, you know. Uh, or do you just travel and absorb the risk altogether? Uh, in which case... I don't know, do I want to be in a hospital in uh, Brazil? Uh, and, and, and no disrespect to Vanderson and those, because I know that they'd look after us very well and all that kind of stuff. But, but you know, I don't speak Portuguese. And it's, I don't know, do I want to be in a hospital in America? And so all those yeah. things come things. So I'm not really... The, the, when I look at the travel industry, I think there's two or three things. I'd, I'd love to hear Gary's view on this and, and Pirangelo, because obviously Pirangelo's in a different situation because he, he would be going home to his family in Italy. Um, but when I think about the travel, it's, I wonder how people feel about travel and tourism brands right now, in terms of how those brands behaved in the first lockdown, and then how they're behaving 
in that intervening period between when we thought we were coming out of COVID-19 and how to communicate with us going into 2021. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, um, like, well, I'm kind. I'm. I'm just keeping keeping an eye on the the time here because we have a good few really good questions coming in. But Theo, do you mind if I jump? You mentioned maybe just bringing Pierangelo and Gary yeah. in just very briefly on on that topic, and then we'll get to the questions because um because we've got some really good ones there. So, um, guys, maybe Pierangelo, do you want to jump in with a with a with a comment on on that side of it? Uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, so the the idea there without uh, around that uh, around tour operators and airlines, I think it's it's a very good discussion and it's. Sometimes it will divide people and say people may love some uh, airlines at the moment and hate others or vice versa. Um, well, personally, from my personal experience, been, I, I used to travel back and forth from Italy, I would say probably once every six weeks. I haven't been home in a, in, since last January, so it's been a year now. And so that's it's massive impact. And to be honest with you, I'm not sure when we'll be allowed to travel. And I had all the... Uh, I had essentially all the trips for the year planned uh, in March. It was the first year probably ever that I had everything planned from holidays all the way to short trips at home. And in fairness, some some airlines, I'm not gonna gonna mention them, but uh, some airlines were quite quickly uh, just issued the vouchers uh, re- relatively quickly. Others I've been waiting for for a very long time. Now the challenge, the, my personal challenge is I need to keep track of those vouchers now. <laughs> so um, that's, uh, I think that that's something that I, I know that in the future I'll be able to use them because of this, my, say the fact that I have my, my family and in another country. But then if I was just booking flights to go on holiday once a year or something, I don't know if I'm ever gonna, gonna use them. And I think that's, that's a challenge and that's probably something that might, might upset some some customers and change their relationship with those islands. And then just before I pass to Gary, I think just to go back to um, quickly to Tio's point earlier where run healthier and say, people want to travel more to safer place or perceive the safe or uh, have less media coverage in this kind of situation. I think Ireland from that point of view is very well positioned in a future perspective because Ultimately, if you look at Ireland from another country, you think about the Green Island. And whatever we think that Dublin might be overpopulated or something, definitely if you live in an apartment or if you live in Dublin, but then if you come as tourists, it's not probably as populated as might be cities like Rome or Milan, for example, in Italy, but any other major capital in Europe. And I think that makes the difference. So I think from if I, if I had to look at the future, I think Ireland is well positioned to start off the on the tourist side sooner than other countries. Um, so, um, Gary, what do you think? Yeah, I it's, it's really interesting when you're talking about all the um, uh, how the like Ryanair and Aer Lingus like engage with like refunds and things like that and, and, and vouchers. And I think like obviously that's in the immediate um, periods like after uh, the, the pandemic came in, like that's really important and obviously it's always going to remain important and people are going to be kind of risk averse about whether to book or not, depending on what their policies are. Well, I think another really interesting aspect of it is, is, is how they actually behave from a, like a kind of like in terms of corporate social responsibility around the pandemic, like speaking to what I was talking about earlier on about how brands communicate uh, and how that communication links to kind of public health information. So if you have like certain airlines who are essentially kind of given a nudge and a wink of how to, you know, bypass restrictions and, you know, and things around getting tests for COVID in order to travel, like that, that raises questions, like that raises questions about social responsibility. And we all know, like, like, like brands like Ryanair are, are very good for kind of, you know, um, you know, kind of engaging with, you know, regulations and stuff like that. And kind of in, in a very kind of a, a nod and a wink and, and it's kind of part of their brand identity, this kind of way of being like resistance to, you know, regulations and things like that. But like, at the end of the day, like this is a health, health public crisis, like, you know, and I think, I think people, I think people will remember this and how brands deal with these types of things. And um, from that perspective, but then also consumers historically have, also have historically have short mem- memories when it comes to these things, and when it comes to things Very like true, <laughs> we've all sworn off Ryanair when we got off a plane because of whatever reason, because they treat you like rubbish, and then you're like, I'll never fly with them again. And then you know, 
two weeks later I'm booking them again. So I'm not I'm not so sure, but yeah. just it's an interesting kind of. I, I'm surprised there hasn't been a bit more controversy about it. Is all I'll say. I I I, I tell you, Gary, I, I I've had a mixed view. Like I, this is the first time in twenty two years that this is the longest period I've been in Ireland. Twenty two years, I, I travel a lot. And um, I'm on my 22nd communication with Aer Lingus to get money back from our flights. The book oh, no. Right? Which is amazingly surprising to me because I'm at the top level in British Airways. So I'm one of the, the, the in, in terms of our group company. Uh, and just, it's so bad, it's unreal. With uh, Air Canada, they gave us vouchers straight away. Not money, but vouchers, so that, that, that was fine, okay? I thought Airbnb, phenomenal. Airbnb just said, here's your refund straight away, no problem at all, etc." And then StubHub, a disaster. Like, basically, they gave us back StubHub credit instead of thing. And when you try to get your money back, you can't. And there's a, there's a class action in America against StubHub at the moment. And Ooh, interesting. So, you know, it, you look at that spectrum, of Airbnb, which is the, let's call it the internet native company, the next generation company, they're the ones who are behaving the most responsibly. And then you go, and I'm not saying Ryanair behaving irresponsibly, but certainly some of their ads were not encouraging what was in the best interest of the public. I think that that's something. And you know, when you think about trust, you're acting, saying, well, do people behave um, with integrity? Are they doing, are they, are they acting best interest of the customers? You know what I mean? And are they confidence? And, and, and you know, the question is whether you trust those brands or not. And, and it does go to that question about who would you trust given your experience? And certainly when I look at the behavior of Emirates, which was, this is what we're going to do. And you're treated like nearly everyone's treated like first class now. Do you know, do you know that kind of way? I, 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 I think that there is a lot to be learned about how you treat customers how you treated customers in that immediate point of the crisis. And as you say, I think their communications and whether they are acting, like the difference between McDonald's and Ryanair in your context. Does yeah, like even outside, like, you know, building brand engagement or any of those other metrics, like it's just there's a moral responsibility to what they're doing, you know? So that's, yeah. We take some of these questions back. So guys, just in, yeah, it, well, <laughs> Make, we'll make this nappy. Maybe we'll just run over slightly over two o'clock, but ever so slightly. So what I'm going to do, there's some really good questions coming in. So what I'm going to do is just read them out and guys just I'm going to take one response from me as opposed to going around the, the, the houses. So maybe just stick up your, your hand if you'd like to address it. So just on what we just talked about, Katie Donahue came in with a, a good comment around Airbnb saying, could Airbnb's response be due to the fact that they are trying to improve brand image? due to their part in having perceived to have destroyed elements of the housing markets, rental areas, that kind of stuff. Um, so is there an opportunity for brands to improve brand image uh, in these situations, Gary? Yeah, I think Katie, you hit the, the nail on the head there. Um, like any opportunity that Airbnb has to improve brand image, I think they, they need to embrace. You know, they're, I, 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 they're in big trouble with this, really. You know, this is their whole, their whole business model is, yeah. is in trouble with this close as they move towards a float um, it was more important than ever um, okay maybe Theo this might be one for you because uh, you brought it up earlier um, this comes in from Lorraine O'Reilly what are some of the long term issues or questions employers should be looking at right now my sense from colleagues is that we are working longer and harder online and it is impacting on per personal satisfaction fatigue connection ways of working etc yeah, I mean, I, 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 okay, so th th this answer might be controversial. I, I think the first thing we have to do is understand whether that's true and how people are working, et cetera, because I think that there's one thing that we know is we, we're, none of us are used to working online and we, we've not, we haven't been trained to work online and that's not our behavior working online. So, but one thing that you have to remember is that we don't know how to work online in, in for long periods like this. So, so that, that's, that's the thing that, you know, we're used to working in, in, in office spaces. Uh, the second thing is, um, some people are definitely working very long hours. Uh, some people, uh, the, the idea that you can turn off now, we used to talk about this idea that with email, you couldn't turn off. With, with Zoom, you, you, 
you literally can't get off the, the, the thing at all, you know, so I, I, even this seminar. Um, so I, I think that the, uh, <laughs> when you think about these things, there's a, a massive change in our day-to-day behaviors. And I, I would say this in, in the context of our, we have a new cadence in our life and how we, our daily activities, and actually how to fit those all in is very complex. And we don't have that experience to work out what's the best way to work in, that, in those kind of conditions. And I think that's a very important thing to think about. I think that um, when we think about things in a different ways, um, I think there's positive aspects about this. I think um, for many companies, I think CEOs have risen to the fore and in, they're more in touch with what's happening with their employees and they're communicating to their employees a lot more and are more involved. I think that that's a good thing. I think, um, I think that um, these are long-term changes and that companies and HR managers should be right now planning for a more flexible workplace moving forward. And I think that also, frankly, I, I would say that they probably need to be planning for a significant proportion of their workforce suffering um, probably mental health or behavioral issues moving forward, probably in a, up to 24, 30, 24 months out. Um, and, and, and it's quite straightforward that even if you think about it, after six, seven months of working online like this, going back to work in the workplace is going to be extremely difficult. And just your behaviors and social distancing in the workplace and things like that. But on top of that, um, the ones I feel particularly, do, I know we've had our difficulties too, is you know, people hire new staff, they have no culture of working in a physical location, they don't know the values of your company, they haven't been onboarded. So bringing them back into the workplace is, is going to be a difficult thing. And um, they don't have the same bond. I think all of the things you mentioned and all the things you're mentioning there are certainly showing there's huge opportunities in HR tech and some of those, some of those platforms, some of the ways that you can bridge um, the gap that's being left behind. I, 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 massive opportunities, massive opportunities. You know, but it's something yeah. that companies so, should be working on, like, right now. And I, I, I put it out there, Patrick. I think there's a call for business schools to review their HR programs and postgraduate programs and see how do we build technology into those programs too? Like, how, how are we going to yeah. build that into yeah. those so we're yeah. training yeah. the next generation of HR managers and executives to manage people remotely, and manage people online and help people build the behaviors to be successfully in their jobs online, but also healthy in their, their, in their mental health. Okay, and we'll just take one more question. Thanks, Theo. We'll take one more question. We'll put this to you, to, your, to yourself, um, uh, Pierangelo. Um, this comes in from Ellen Smith. Do you guys think that masks are going to be a new normal in Western culture? Even before the pandemic in Japan, Korea, etc., masks would always be worn by someone if they were sick. Um, well, I don't have the crystal ball, so I'm not sure, but my point of view would be, I, I don't think so. And the reason is, I mean, there are countries where wearing masks was, was more widespread than, West, say, Western countries, if you want. But that's mostly due to the fact that they had incredible amount of uh, uh, pollution in the, in the air, for example. I remember we went, for a, went to China on a trip in the middle of the winter, and we were looking out the window in the morning. We thought it was, mo- uh, sorry, it was, um, was fog. It wasn't, <laughs> okay? And th- that's, that's how bad it was. Ooh. And so... In, there are countries where this, the use of masks was most related to the fact that the air quality was quite poor. In, in Europe so far, even though some cities have air quality, which is um, the quality of the air quality they have is, say, is uh, up for discussion. But um, I, don't think it's, I don't think it would become part of our culture, to be honest. I, just, uh, I think everyone would, would agree that it's just... It's very, it's very frustrating wearing a mask when you go around shopping center or something. So I think we all look forward to get rid of them. But that's just my point of view. I don't know what's going on. I, actually, I'm curious to see what's going on. 
I, I was I was talking the other day with yeah, Mark well, and what, what, what do we feel like when we walk in the shopping center or in the shop without wearing a mask? I just uh, well, I think when and it's one of those things that like as we've been talking about, there's so many unknowns around this, and it's just fascinating to have heard your your thoughts on where things are going, all three of you, but also some of the things we've seen in other countries and whether they pan out as well. So uh, my fe- my feeling is that th- this this particular session, we should pick it up again in about six months. Let's just get back together, get everyone back on the call and let's see what has come through and what hasn't, because this is certainly something we could do every so often. Um, so look, we've we've uh, for everybody watching, thank you so much. We've held you six minutes over and got to as many of your questions as I could. There are some other excellent questions that we just did not get time for because as you can tell there's just so much in this so apologies for uh, for not getting to everything but thank you um all the same so look uh, guys just to say thank you to professor theo lynn professor of digital business here at dcu business school um here and also to be known as thor from now on i believe uh, dr pierangelo rosetti uh rosetti assistant professor in business analytics at dcu business school and dr gary sinclair lecturer in marketing specializing in consumer behavior at dcu business school thank you so much it's been a fast discussion um, and guys our next transform event will be smart cities and communities and will take place uh february 8th to 12th stay tuned on our social media channels for more information thanks again everyone take care thank you Project.